Uh oh, Susie, wait! I can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that. There you go. There you go. Welcome to Healing Our Communities, a live podcast conversation on Black Lives Matter, hosted by Our Stories Matter podcast. I'm Susie Hess, and I'm Sam Lasalde. Uh, Susie and I are co-hosts for Our Stories Matter that dropped last Sunday, um, and uh, you know I want to introduce. Um, my my buddy uh, T. Um, well, actually, actually no, not just yet. <laughs> I, I, I want to talk about um, 
you know, how, how I kind of sort of came on to, you know, Our Stories Matter podcast and, um, and the relevance it has really for, for my life and, and sharing not just my narrative, but the narrative of so many young uh, brown and black folks in our communities across LA. Um, you know, uh, I've spent much of my youth in uh, juvenile hall and juvenile encampment. And I have uh, several family members that I've lost through um, police uh, violence. And uh, it's just really such, such an, an honor and a privilege to be able to have a platform and share some of these stories, not just of my own, but of, of our community members and, and many of our change makers that are also uh, going to be on this platform with us. So we created Our Stories Matter out of a need to highlight the power of healing, liberation, and truth through story. Empathy, connection, healing, and activism start with community. And as Monique Moore stated, healing happens in community, not in isolation. So we are very fortunate tonight to have our first storyteller from Our Stories Matter podcast, um, with us tonight, Alexis Roan, who is a writer, storyteller, producer, and a revolutionary artist. So, Wave, welcome, Alexis. Hey, Alexis. <laughs> hey, guys. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. And, and I also want to introduce my, my brother, uh, uh, T, uh, Torrance Brandon Reeds. He's out here making a difference with our with our future, our youth, through his music and activism. Um, he's the man behind the music uh, for OSM for Our Stories Matter. He's the founder of Family um, Incorporated. Uh, he's a, he's also an MSW from USC, a father of four daughters, uh, Kelly, Candice, Felicia, and Jasmine. Uh, born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, Tori's a vocalist, a dancer, an educator a youth uh, advocate, a writer, a poet, a songwriter, radio, TV, he's, he's all around, just <laughs> awesome. Uh, he founded the Foundation for the Arts, Mentoring, uh, Leadership and Innovation in 92, uh, under which his dynamic uh, youth mentoring, life mastering programs, see a man, be a man, the Princess the Queen uh, operate. In addition, uh, his uh, family incorporated produces film and community arts, festivals, uh, photo gatherings, cultural tours, music and arts concerts, and workshops. Uh, so yeah, so, so T is just an all around positive. Um, it looks like we have a little feedback. So before I go, I just want to make sure that everyone is on mute in the green room. Amazing visionary and moderator for tonight's forum, um, and TILA steering committee member, Ramona Mushan. Ramona is a native Angelino with over 20 years experience with public social services and child welfare in LA County. Ramona champions work in the area of equity for all African-American children and addresses trauma and healing. So welcome the visionary Ramona. Yeah. Oh, you're muted now, Ramona. Oh, yeah, Ramona. You can hear me. Okay, sorry, guys. Well, thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. We know that there's not enough time to unravel a problem this magnitude, but we'll do our best to frame this conversation to discuss how our story in history has got it to a moment like this, to discuss how we begin to heal over 400 years of oppression, discrimination, and trauma. So I'm going to toss it over to our a resident storyteller, Alexis Roan, and she's gonna take us through a little bit of our history and kind of bringing us up to how we got here today, Alexis. Okay. Thank you, Ramona. Uh, there's an African proverb that says, the story of the hunt glorifies the hunter, that is until the lion gets its turn. I love that proverb because it gives us a sense of uh, how 
we decide whose story we believe based on who basically has access to the mic. So the hunter is going to tell this fantastical story uh, about how he got the lion. But the lion, when the lion gets his turn, is going to talk about how that hunter cried, prayed, repented, crapped his pants, all kinds of stuff. The hunter, the lion has a story as well. And so there is a profound experience with um, how we determine who gets access to the mic because they get to control the narrative. But something very interesting happened um, here recently. May 30th, um, there was a young woman named Kimberly Jones who released a video that went viral. Uh, and in this video, she does this remarkable, um, she gives us great metaphor. It's a very accessible metaphor. In her story, she says, uh, imagine that you have played, we played 400, uh, we played a Monopoly, 400 rounds of Monopoly. And in those 400 rounds of Monopoly, you have people, uh, the opponent is taking all of the earnings. So they they uh, like two people are playing Monopoly, but one group is like owning everything, uh, not allowing the other group to have um, the, the, the labor, the fruits of their own labor. And then she says, take and you play an additional 50 rounds of Monopoly and um, the they're thriving. The you know, the one group is thriving, but the their opponent is like uh, mad because they're thriving. And so they go in and they burn down, you know, and they, you know, they, they, they destroy all of the fruits of their labor that way. So you have the Tulsa riots, you have uh, the riots in Wilmington, you have black, you know, the, the burning of what black wall street. And then you have an additional 50 years, which is what we're living into right now. And it's 50 years of, of um, laws. It's 50 years of a psyche that says, uh, well, what's the point? There's this sort of this resolve with hopelessness, like, well, what's the point? Because, you know, over 450 rounds of Monopoly, they've been, you know, manipulating the game against us. And every time we try to win, uh, they do something. Uh, no one wants to own where they have cheated. They only want to somehow blame their opponent for what's been happening. And so what was really profound about that, um, that analogy was she so eloquently captured all of that. Now, here's what's happened. Because she does not have, quote, the kind of pedigree that we grant access to the mic, there are some people who have dismissed that very powerful and profound metaphor and history lesson that she gave us. She broke it down like a like, you know, like a fraction, like, you know, so that it can forever and consistently be broke. First thing. The second thing that happened was in her uh, dis discourse, she said she was trained uh, as a young person uh, through the PUSH organization, which is the Reverend Jesse Jackson's um, organization. What was interesting for me about that fact is all of the years, all of the black comedians, all of the stand up acts that mocked Reverend Jackson and would say things like, when is he going to get a job? We have this way of not only um, granting access to the micro people who, you know, who have pedigree, but then the people who are behind the scenes doing the work, we mock them for the work that they're doing. But this is what we have going on right now. What we're experiencing right now is the fruit of seeds that were planted, like, like it's, it's harvest time. So there is a lot of different ways in which we have not navigated space well. Um, the our oppressors have not, um, they like, this is the fruit, like they're, they're now bearing the fruit of the seeds that they planted. And, um, you know, if you don't like your harvest, plant better seeds. And so what I very much believe in um, is that the, you know, healing is possible. Um, redemption is, is, is real. We can pull this thing together, but it does not happen if we don't first acknowledge where we are complicit where we have done things uh, improperly in the past and where we have got to be careful to grant people access to the mic and not make it about pedigree, but recognizing that everyone has something profound to say, to share. And the solutions are all in our story. As Samuel put at the, at the start of our, our time together, he was like, look, here's where I came from. Here's my experience with this. Yes. 
And that is so important that we know that. And um, where we have failed in the past is who has been able to control the mic. When we all have said, oh, you must have this, 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 this in order to be credible, then we have lost our way. The, it was just announced today that the op-ed editor for the New York Times has resigned because he uh, printed um, Tom Cotton's uh, op-ed without even reading it. He just printed it and it was a bunch of bullshit. And so uh, he has been given kudos for printing uh, the, the the case for reparations by Ta you know, Ta Ta Nehisi Coates. And um, I commented, I bet he read that one before he published it. So even for all of the ways that people are trying to say, oh, well, you know, he's not that bad a person. He's done some really good things. Well, he, he he's part of the problem. We have not granted equal access to the mic, even though everyone has something to say. And I believe that story becomes that great leveler um, because story is the way that we can hear uh, and relate to each other's experience. So how do we get here? We got here because one person has been controlling the mic. We got here because we have permitted that um, that voice to dominate. Uh, and the way that we're going to get out of here is that we have to increase the number of voices, non pedigreed voices, people who are in the trenches, um, who have something as prevalent as Kimberly Jones to say, they're going to lead us out of this. We're going to be all right eventually. Uh, but first, just acknowledge that the um, the fruit that we are experiencing right now is because of seeds that we planted. You don't like this, you don't like this harvest? Harvest season, the, the planting season will come around again. Plant better seeds. Just listening to what you're saying, um, just listening to what you're saying, it really resonates a lot with me. When you think about how this country was built on racism over 400 years, as I said, of oppression, you know, we have to kind of figure out ways to start to unravel that because it's so embedded, the structural racism in our society and also how the story is being told about us, right? Mm -hmm. So even in social media, in the news clips you're seeing online right now, um, what do we see, right? Even when the protest or the riots started, it was look at what those people are doing. Look at how they're trying to make their, their voices heard. But when you pan in, right, you saw the helicopters panning in on who was actually really causing some of this unrest. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do we begin to unravel those stories? Or even now you see that with uh, Senator Paul Rand really trying to stop an anti-lynching law, which you would think be to be a no-brainer in wow. today's society. Yeah. How do we start to shift that narrative and protect the story that's being told about us? Yeah, the first thing we have to do is we have to own the power that we have. We cannot walk around with this sort of defeatist, oh my God, look at what they've done, what they've always done. We're like so hopeless, that sort of thing. The whole trauma-informed care model requires like uh, empowerment is, is, is big. Uh, recognizing where we have adapted to all sorts of things, recognizing where we are resilient. Yeah, mm -hmm. we are the, um, you know, we, we experience uh, these, um, you know, we're, we're not, um, we're magic, but we're, we're also real. So there are things that have happened. And like, why is it that they've not been taken out yet? Well, you know what? You know, we are resilient. And so we need to, um, to own that. But part of owning that is recognizing and owning the power that we have. Part of that power is voting, you know, uh, uh, Paul Rand's ass out. Like he, he can be gone. <laughs> like, you know, so there's a way to do that. And so, um, so own that power. And also when you hear something, you know, when somebody says something dumb, um, you just have to cancel that um, in the atmosphere by putting your own story out there or deciding whether or not it needs to be addressed at all. Does your time and your energy need to go to something else uh, for, for years? And I, I learned this years ago. I was a teenager and Oprah did. Um, there was a she had a guest on there and they were talking about how to make decisions. And the guest said 10, 10, 10. Uh, think about uh, how you will, when you're trying to figure out like uh, how to act on a particular thing, think about how you're going to feel 10 minutes from this decision, 10 months or 10 years. So I think that one of the things that we have to be careful of is that they don't keep us busy doing a bunch of stuff that in 10 minutes, it's not going to make a difference. Like there are some things that we can be investing in some, some uh, very uh, specific acts that should be focused that we're, should, that should be our focus uh, that will net gains, you know, 10 months, 10 years from now, we have to have the, the long, right. the long game uh, in mind. And we also have to recognize that the, um, the war, um, the, the the war on um on dehumanization 
it's ceaseless. It goes on and on. So this is not something that we can elect the right people and then, oh, we can chillax on the beach. Uh, like we have to constantly know that there's always going to be somebody that's coming up and that's OK as long as we continue to stand in our power and to recruit the right um, to recruit the right. Uh, I guess mindsets and and narratives, um, and 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 recognize that there are some good people who literally just don't know. So we can't be the person who just kind of like says, "Oh, there, you know, you know, all is hopeless." Um, there are folks who are ready to partner with us. There are folks who are hungry for like, how do we become an active and a sustainable part of this fight? And we have got to um to to lean into that and to trust you know, that that's a thing. We, we, we can, we can fight our way out of this. We're going to be good. Um, but we, um, we just have to, to own our power to not, you know, resolve ourselves to like, Oh, like, you know, oh, the world is hopeless. Um, we're not even, we're not even pioneers in this. Uh, I, I was blessed to, um, be invited to be the, the, one of the, uh, to be a, uh, the, the storyteller of the history of African-Americans in Raleigh. Um, this, uh, it was part of the, the mayor's unity, Day event uh, was held the last Saturday of February. It was part of like the Black History Recognition Program for the city of Raleigh. And so I was blessed to um, learn and to have to like codify in this really cool presentation about the history of African Americans in Raleigh. And uh, my frame was uh, one of my, I, you know, history was, it used to not be a, a really strong subject until I was in uh, my, my junior year at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, the late Dr. Um, Tom Philpott. He uh, taught, uh, he, he opened the, 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 the semester by giving us the frame. He said, for him, history is not a, um, it's not a recollection of, time, of dates and events. He said, history is the study of human nature and us asking questions about what the hell were they thinking when they did that? Or how the hell did they overcome all of that? So it was with that frame that I had to, um, research the the African the, the different African American um sites and uh important African American figures uh uh that were um born and, and relevant to Raleigh, North Carolina, including people like, you know, the Delaney sisters uh having our say. Uh they were born here and they um they were interned here um uh and the um uh, the Oakwood uh historical cemetery. It's a be beautiful cemetery uh here in Raleigh. And so um anyway so having to learn all of that history, what I realized was that when you have people who are bold and 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 coming to your house uh, with the intent of you know kidnapping you, killing you because they don't like your voice, okay, that's one kind of pressure. Um, that's not the kind of pressure that we necessarily have. Now there is some bullshit that is definitely happening, but there are some things that are easier for us. There's a way in which our ancestors and the people who've come before us have made it easier for us to stand up. And to be heard and to be counted. And so I love to look back on their sacrifices and the work that they put in and say, I am without excuse. And so honoring the, the, their legacy uh, and the hard work that they have done. Um, I am, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm committed to that. So, um, I, you know what? And I just realized that I was, I, I didn't, I didn't know if you were trying to cut me off to, I was listening to you and I love listening to you, but I did want to talk about some of the things you were saying or, you know, respond to something you said a while ago about how we were showing up and, you know, what story is being told about what we're, how we're showing up. So just recently, my son, who is a millennial um, attorney, advocate, <laughs> he came across this tweet and I really wish we, we could have found out to credit you know, where it came from, but it was so profound to really tell a story about how we unite. He said, people aren't protesting just to protest. They believe in you, in our society. They care. They think that you care about fellow humans, that you will create change. If you show how much you've been hurt and you show how much you've been oppressed and you show ways to fix it, literally ways to fix it, then what are we going to do with that, right? How the, how can these things be implemented for the betterment, just, just not just of Black people, but for all humans? So when we think about Black lives and the human race, the real choice is whether or not we're going to show up in a meaningful way. When I say we, I mean we all of society. So how do you think that in the conversation you were having, how do you think we can get people to show up, to be united, and that not to, not to seem an us against them story? 
against them is not, um, again, whose report do you believe? Uh, if the most pervasive voice at the mic is that it's us against them, number one, do we trust that voice? Or do we feel like that narrative is being spun so that um, the, 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 the discord is more salacious? And perhaps that's not the truth. What if there are genuine efforts at connecting and they just don't have access to the mic? I, on my feed, I'm seeing all kinds of beautiful examples of communities coming together. I just had a conversation this evening with a lovely person who said, I did not know Lex. And so I have just, and they started naming off all of these different historical figures. You know, she was like, I, I watched a documentary on Thurgood Marshall and uh, I was checking out a documentary on James Baldwin and, and all these different things. And she said, I didn't know. Now what's interesting is that I've gone my whole life knowing all of like they, they are that uh, James Baldwin and Thurgood Marshall, they are very deeply entrenched in my academic experience. Um, and so however it is that they, it was kept from them. Um, I'm grateful that they eventually got to that point. So in terms of how to get everyone to that point, I think the first thing is for us to, to accept that um, there are some things that are happening that are really good and we have to, be uh, reminded and to put that narrative out there so that others can see, hey, am I doing enough? Because sometimes enough is simply to just become aware. So if they've not been engaged in this, I don't expect them to go full on. You know, when I was learning math, I did not jump into calculus. You know, first I had to learn the numbers and the primary, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a process. And so we have got to be patient with people who are do who are learning or gracious. I, 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 let me let me say gracious with people who are um, they didn't know what they didn't know. The question that I have is um, while we are not responsible for our oppression, we are responsible for our healing and our resilience and the way that we approach this. How do we show up? If I'm all the time concerned with how do everybody else come and do this, uh, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to model for you uh, my worth, my value, um, my intentions, my good intentions, my intentions for all of us thriving. Mm -hmm. There is no lack. There is no scarcity. I don't operate and I don't feel that um, anyone's best interest is served by me playing small or by me acting like there is uh, like there, there are so few resources. Right. I have to trust that what has really happened is the hoarding. People are hoarding. That's why there's an, so we have to address that, but I have to be the one to show up, you know, fully, you know, uh, Alexis grace, uh, my reverently irreverent self and, um, and to trust that those things that I don't know to do, because sometimes the answer with the most integrity is I don't know. Um, however, what do you want done for you? Do that for others. And what I want done for me, I'm going to also do for myself. And I'm going to show you how to, you know, how to make these things. So it's a really complicated and a layered process. And what I don't want to do is to make people think that, okay, I'm going to take notes and it's just this one step and then we're going to do this. Planting and harvesting is a process and a lot of it. We don't have any control. We don't have control of when, you know, when we see the growth, we don't have control over the, you know, how it's watered. Uh, like there, there are so many things that we don't control. So I think um, let's not lose hope and let's not burn daylight and waste energy by trying to do the work and the thinking for other people. Let's just say, hey, listen, I don't know. You don't know. Let's, let's figure this out together. And the other thing is this. We don't have to hog the, the, we don't have to, to be media whores. We don't have to be the people who are like chasing the very folks who don't all the time tell the right story. They don't make room for the right story, but I'm grateful for all of the technological advances that permit us to get out there anyway. So like that, you know, we, we, we need to be vigilant and we need to uh, to to search out all of those other things, because, again, going back to that Kimberly Jones video, what I heard in her um, in her six minute and 36 second video was solutions. People out there trying to, like, talk about all the chaos. I'm like, uh, -uh I'm, I'm, I'm doing solutions. Right. Here. I'm, 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 so, doing solutions. I'm giving space for solutions. So, Sam, I want to give you an opportunity because I know that you also are a social worker and advocate out there trying to make a difference. What are some things that you have seen in the community just in terms of 
going up against oppression and discrimination as yourself, a man who, a young man who's been through a lot. Can you kind of give us a little bit of insight into that? Yeah, you know, um, uh, in in my experience, just as as a young man growing up in uh, you know largely uh, brown community, but but I've seen it in, in black and brown ones, is that there's this there's this blanket sort of just placed over uh, all of the young people in our community um, and and uh, whether whether we fit it or not uh, uh, we have we have to wear this blanket we have to wear this jacket right and uh, that sort of then just starts to begin to form what our what our interpretation what our experiences uh, are of, of law enforcement of um, uh, just authority I guess in that sense um, and so, uh, for me, this is a really, uh, just an awesome opportunity to, to, you know, have a platform and be able to voice a little bit of what, uh, my experience has been, what it's been for a lot of the young people that, uh, I've grown up with and the young people that continue to grow up in the communities where, I, where I've come from. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Um, I see our other storyteller, our speaker has come in, uh, Torrance Brandon Reese. So, uh, Ray, um, if you could really kind of give us some insight. I know you may be because of some technical difficulties that we had missed some of the conversation, but I really kind of want you to speak on um, where we're at right now in regards to what we're seeing, how people are showing up in the community to really be positive and be a force in the community to really address racism and oppression. As Alexis said, you know, we have to be responsible for how we show up. So can um, you kind of respond to that a little bit for me? Wait, wait a second. I don't think they can hear you, Tori, because we're stuck on Sam. And I don't know, Anthony, can you change that? Because uh, nothing that he's saying is still on Sam. Oh, and now he's gone. <laughs> uh, All right. That's fine. Um, okay. We're just going to keep going. Okay. <laughs> um, All right. So let's switch back to split screen if we could do that. And then I'll just make a comment that we can start to talk about. We apologize for all of the technical difficulties we're having tonight. We're using a new platform, so please forgive us um, for talking about that. Um, I'm gonna, you know, kind of pivot a little bit to talk about some of the things, some of the things that you know we're fighting against in regards to oppression. I know that uh, some people may have an issue of us saying, you know, Black Lives Matter, and all lives do matter, but in a time such as this they don't matter as much as black lives because black lives are the ones that have been dismissed. Our struggles and all systems have been ignored. Even now in this pandemic, there are more black lives being taken due to health disparities. Uh, there's more arrest for black lives, harsher sentencing, racial profiling, uh, literally hunted down and killed. Three times more likely to be killed by police disproportionately represented in child welfare. I could personally speak to that, what I've seen in regards to that disproportionately dying at birth due to black maternal mortality. Mothers are dying when they give birth. Black mothers are dying when they give birth to their children. You pick any social determinant and you'll see that black lives have not mattered to enact changes in our society to safeguard our lives. So we're forever changing this society. We can never say that we don't know about the struggles of black lives. So yeah. this is effectively the reality we're living in. What are some of the things that you have seen that you feel we can really make a substantial, substantive, long-lasting change in our society in regards to Black Lives Matter? Is that for Torrance? It's for um, Alexis or you, Sam, because I think that Tori fell off again. Oh, you're back, Torrance. I don't see, I don't see you on the screen. That's why I didn't know you were back. I apologize. Um, 
So Alexis, you can start and we can see, um, Anthony, if we can get uh, Tori on the screen and he can respond after Alexis. Okay, it's like I keep looking back and forth at the, the different things. So tell me what was my question again? I'm so sorry, I was looking at. Mm -hmm. Right. Of, of, of for Black Lives. Yeah. Again, yeah. that, you know, that goes back to, um, you know, what I had mentioned earlier about how layered is that um, layered is the response, uh, layered is the responsibility, um, how deeply embedded there are so many, um, you know, intersections of, of things that need to be happening. Uh, so I, uh -oh. Uh -oh. I don't, I think there's like, there's some feedback or something. Um, so, you know, again, how do we show up in the space? Uh, what is it that we need? And to also recognize that we're not a monolithic group. There are some of us who need more than others. Uh, I am a person who believes in the power of the healing narrative. And so I show up everywhere um, helping others to own their story, to not be afraid or ashamed of where they've been, to see the, um, the fact that in their story, there are solutions. I'm not the person who shows up. And uh, and as uh, one of my really good friends, she has um, a nonprofit dealing with with um, infant mortality uh, amongst African American women. That is how she shows up, and so uh, she and she's very like all of her her initiatives and her her issues are, are targeted in that way to protect that space. There are other folks, uh, you know, my my minister friends. Um, they believe very much in the spiritual component of the scene because one thing that I'll say that um, and it's not real popular, uh, but it is the truth according to uh, the gifts of my insight. When we talk about uh, one one of my one of the many conversations that I've been, that I had uh, over the course of a week, uh, lots of folks were ready to like to just they were looking for some insight, and uh, one of the guys, um, he um, non black guy, he said, um, "Well, I don't hate any race," and by the comment, he was implying that what we are seeing is hatred. And so I had to break it down for us. Like, you know what? Anger is not hatred. Anger is grief at the fact that 400 plus year rounds of monopoly <laughs> with all of the terrorism that, you know, that has happened on the psyches of black people and the things that continue to happen, the things that they are still boldly doing. And it is exhausting. And so we can have one of, of two, you know, positions. We can be quiet and, and try to be as hidden as possible. Um, or we can, you know, we can, we can show up and we can speak up. Now the protesters are showing up and they're speaking up. And there are other ways that other people are showing up and speaking up as well. Kimberly Jones showed up and she spoke up on the mic. So there are so many different options that we have, but I think that, um, to recognize that anger is grief and that anger, uh, that grief can also be worked through. Uh, we, we can manage this. And so how do we manage it? Well, there is a role for the politician. There is a role for the preacher. There is a role for the psychologist. There are so many, there's a role for the philosopher. Uh, there is a role for the teacher. There's a role for the community activist. There is a, like, so there are all of these options, um, for, for dealing with this and to try to lay it on one particular group and to fair. So I say, hey, all hands on deck. What is it that you are called to do? What do you feel led to do? What feels real, meaningful and right for you? Do that. Do that. And, um, and, and, and show up as your full amazing self. And we're going to allow the mystery of what we don't, so what we don't, what we don't know and what we can't yet see. Um, we're going to let that guide us. And uh, then we're going to be able to look back and say, ah, that decision. Because the other thing is this, we assume that, um, we forget that history is prophecy, but as things were happening in history, they had no idea of the impact. All they knew was, okay, this is the work that I can do. I can't do everything, but this part right here, 
like I'm, I'm, I'm good for this part. And then they lean into that. And so I think that that is a great model, um, a way forward for us. What, what can you do? What, like, what is accessible to you? What stirs your heart? Like what, where do you feel called? Lean into that. Um, and, uh, and, and then we're going to see what, what shows up when everyone intends good and everyone recognizes and respects the humanity of the other. And if you don't, um, like expect to have, you know, there, there are consequences for that. We've heard a lot about asking for reparations or people talking about we want equality. And that is just something that really, um, really gets up under our skin. It's to understand that the need isn't for equal, the need is for equity. So there's a big difference between equality and equity. So um, hopefully, I was hoping uh, Tori could really speak to this because I know that he had some information he wanted to share in regards to reparations and what equality and equity looks like in the community. But um, we still have an audio issues, Anthony, or are we good? I'm still hearing the reverb back in the back. Um, I really kind of want to have that conversation. So while we're waiting again, I'm sorry, Tori, while we're trying to fix that, can you respond to the equity question just in regards to you know, there's a difference, right? There's a big difference between asking for equal and asking for equity. So how do we get there? How do we get to equity? Yeah, and uh, to recognize that we didn't get to unequity overnight, and so we're not going to get to equity overnight. Uh-oh. I can't hear you, Ravona. Okay. Can, yeah. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> Well, it's going to take an effort, a combined effort. It's going to take the efforts, of course, of the people who are the oppressed. The oppressed have always fought back. There's a narrative that, that says that people were scared, that they were waiting for someone else to come and free them. That has never been our truth as African people, right? We've always had allies. As far back in history as you can go in the 400-year history here in America, African people, Black people have always had allies, right? But at the same time, those allies would not have been attracted to a people who didn't want their freedom, who hadn't fought for their freedom. So again, as we see in the streets right now, not only in America, but around the world, there's a combined effort on the part of people who learn, who yearn for freedom and who recognize that all people need to be free. But those who are the most oppressed have always fought back. You know, of course, we can talk about that, Nat Turner. We can talk about 1811 in New Orleans, the largest slave insurrection in the history of this nation. We've always advocated for ourselves and we will have to continue to do that. And we're seeing that play out right now. And there's an emergence of new young leaders who the major media didn't know about, but who are on social media and who've been a part of the Black Lives Matter me uh, uh, movement and other movements. And all of these movements are converging right now and people have woken up. You know, there's new technology of being able to film something from your phone. Uh, it's something that we all need to master. I, I put out a, a post, a Facebook post, a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, encouraging people to master their phones, that this is a new weapon that we can use uh, to gain some kind of equity in society. It's tragic that we have to look at death to become inspired to do something. But if that's what it takes, then at least we have the evidence right now that we can utilize. And so people all over the world, as we've seen, are awakened now. They want freedom and liberation, particularly for black people who they know have been marginalized for many, many years, for much too long. And so as we move forward, we have to build on that which came before us. Somebody, uh, Sister Lex, you mentioned earlier uh, about speaking for ourselves. That's also our tradition. Frederick Douglass started his own newspaper. Ida B. Wells started her own newsletter. Marcus Garvey started his own news, uh, newspaper. Malcolm X was the one who founded Mohammed Speaks. Uh, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois, the Crisis Magazine. And so, it's important that as the narratives are crafted that we understand they have to craft our own narrative. You can't depend on somebody else to tell your story for you. And that's why I love forums like this, where we get a chance to speak directly to the people. Uh, so Susie, thank you again for putting this together and, and uh, giving us an opportunity to speak directly to the people from our hearts, our minds, and our souls. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> That was great, Tori, actually. It was a very good answer. You know, just looking at, again, um, 
we still need to figure out how do we show up to create equity? So Alexis, I know I still want to kind of get your input in regards to that, because again, we, we tell our stories, again, we go out, we want to be seen, we want to be heard, we want people to see us show up and to know why we're showing up and why it matters, why Black Lives Matter, why we deserve equity, why it's been taken away from us, from us for so many years. What does equity look like in America? How do we get to equity, Alexis? Yeah, again, that uh, that question is so uh, it's it's so deep. How do we get to equity? And like I, I started to say, we get to equity by first accepting and acknowledging that we didn't get to inequity overnight. And so equity is going to look, um, gosh, it, it, it feels like it's uh, it's going to be a distant thing. But there are some some ways that we can do that. So, for example, something happened to me um, uh, two was it two weeks ago? I guess it's been about two weeks ago now. Um, I'm a part of a co-working space. And uh, one of the, uh, I, I was recording um, content. I had two very important meetings and uh, I've not been able to announce any of these things, but these are like, like really huge, um, huge, ex- huge meetings that I was having uh, online. And, you know, again, with, with COVID-19, like, you know, the whole social distancing uh, and, and both of the, one of, uh, they were all uh, on the West Coast. So um, I'm in this, the space uh, and it's an open space. And so it's like where people are, you know, hanging out, they're talking, there's a, a beer tap and, and all of those sorts of things. There were three instances of this one particular um, guy who also, you know, shares that space, white guy. Um, he was trying to silence me. And uh, at first he came over, you know, with a white woman. And they stood literally right in front of me. The people on camera couldn't see me because like, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, but, but they were behind my, cam- they were like, you know, behind my computer being very, very um, disruptive. Um, and, you know, they got loud and I just got louder because I didn't even realize initially that it was about me. Uh, and then the second time he brought an older white guy who over, this guy turns on the water faucet, lets it run like just you know, to just to create this sort of, I guess, you know, it's supposed to be background noise or what have you. Uh, and then the two of them come and they attempt to have a louder and a longer conversation. But again, you know, my decibels are pretty strong. Uh, and then the third time was the boldest act of small dickery is what I is how I describe that. Event. He came over by himself. His his um, laptop was about 50 feet from where I was sitting, where I, where I was posted and having this very important meeting. And he comes over with his phone. He does not have his headset. And he literally stands in front of me playing this video and laughing as if I'm not doing anything important and as if his need to just silence me in these very um, uh, bold ways, um, bullying ways was the thing that he needs to do. Now, the problem is that he didn't know that I am Alexis Rome. Uh, On most days, I'm Alexis Grace, but in the right situation, I can quickly be Alexis from Texas. He didn't know that. He was about to, but I needed to play my part um, of being sane and being um, gracious on camera because of this very important meeting that I was having. Um, And so what I did was while I was having this meeting, I took my phone out. I put it on the tripod and I just push record. When he realized that he was being recorded, he quickly moved away. And then he had one of the other guys who had been talking with him earlier come behind me to see what was being filmed. And then once they realized that like he was being filmed, he grabbed all of his things and he left before my meeting had wrapped because I had planned on seeing him. And I feel like by the grace of God, he was not present, uh, you know, in, in that space um, when, when I was done, because I was not sure uh, who would show up. It was Alexis Grace or Alexis from Texas, especially now that I got him on videotape. Uh, but he left. And uh, I shot off a note and uh, and I sent the video um, to the the owners of the property. And I said to them, like, OK, here's the boldest act of small dickery that has been happening. I was like, and now they like, you know, what's happening in our country. And so white men are feeling empowered to silences. Bless their hearts. Sometimes you encounter the right one. And so I think that what happened with him two weeks ago, he just encountered the right one. But I did tell them the, the owners of the property, I was like, listen, I suggest you handle it in this way. And I gave them my suggestions. And then I said, um, I am more than equipped to uh to 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 teach this guy 
uh, a responsible way to engage uh, in the world. Um, but I'm going to let you be, you know, like, you know, do your due diligence. As a result of all of that, I have been appointed to all of these different commissions. And I, can you come in and join this? And can you be there? We want to have these conversations. We clearly don't know what we don't know. And um, the way to handle equity is to when you get the invitations, be ready, accept them uh, and show up fully who you are with your stories and uh, say, I'm going like we're going to work together to figure you know, to figure this out. And if it comes out that you're not really about the business, that has nothing to do with me because I am. In regards to where we've been, we've kind of lightly, I'll say lightly because it's a lot, touched upon some of the things that are going on right now. Um, how do we shift into really healing trauma? I know that some of the things that, you know, they say evidence-based, and, and I say that cautiously because I don't believe that there has been that m much attention given to evidence-based uh, care for African-Americans. You know, so there's um, emotional emancipation circles, which I had the opportunity of getting, getting some training with, with Dr. Show Grills of Loyola, amazing training if you haven't been through it and to experience it, to sit down and really be able to heal from anti-racism trauma, right? But there are other things aside from that one thing, but we know that that could be very healing to be in a support group of people who look like you, with people who understand you and have shared lived experiences as you do, right? So what are some other ways that we could build into the community, sew up the community and to heal from the trauma that continues to inflict us? And it's really hard to heal, I'll say this before you respond, when you're constantly being abused at the same time you're trying to heal. Alexis? I wasn't going to speak up this time. I was like, because what if that one was for Tori? Uh, so while you were saying that there was another um, an, another question that came up that I think kind of uh, dovetails into that, um, where someone was asking about like the, how, like what's the role of fictional narratives? What do they have in, in sort of educating the masses? And so um, I want to kind of speak to both of those um, by saying that when we talk about healing, we have to be very clear that healing is, um, it takes on so many different components. There's a, a physical healing, there's a, an emotional, a spiritual healing, there's a, a healing of the psyche. And there are so many amazing people who are on, on the ground doing this work. Uh, Dr. Wade Nobles, for example, is, um, uh, you know, he he's a, a foremost scholar in, in in healing the African psyche. So he he is like very deeply in, in, entrenched in the, um, uh, like I, I call he, he he's pedigreed uh, in in this content, and so he's doing amazing work. Um, Dr. Brunel Anderson, um, Dr. B, she has this um, video log called um, "Beloved um, Beloved Blackness," and she records these like two to five minute video snippets of. Uh, of practical things that we can do, such as stop walking around. I love, you know, what Brother Tori talked about. Uh, we're not this fearful people. We've always been, you know, revolutionary in our acts and in our actions. But it helps to keep a particular group comfortable if they believe that somehow we are passive and we're not going to act and we're going to acquiesce to their, you know, so there is some like whoever it is that's 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 spinning that narrative that has something to lose uh, by um, not promoting the fact that we have always been, you know, uh, revolutionary and and vocal and and present and fighting, you know, the systems that that's a part of of the history, but that doesn't get told because the 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 easier narrative is, oh, okay, they're going to play nice if you know if we play nice nicely with them. Okay. Okay. So he's okay. Oh, was it? Oh, okay. I, Cause I, I didn't hear any of it. Um, but, but, uh, uh, so again, w w when we're talking healing, um, you know, there's the physical healing, there's the emotional healing, there's the, the spiritual healing, there's the, the healing of the psyche. And there are uh, healers on each one of those platforms that are working. And, um, one of the things that I did when I first began to um, I didn't realize this is what I was doing at the time, but I was practicing, um, uh, the healing arts as a wounded healer. And what I wanted to do was to expose my wounds that, uh, where I, where I'd healed, uh, I had done the work and I now wanted to be, um, 
an active force in healing others. What I wanted to do was I wanted to fully show up as myself. Um, and I felt like the platform that would give me a longer, um, I don't know, longer reach was writing fiction. So the very first story that I told was a series of young adult novels written for urban, reluctant reading teens and preteens in, uh, who did not grow up in a religious context. So, uh, and what I wanted to do, my mission was to pull them into the reading family. My, uh, the, the healing that I wanted was for them to recognize that the, a lot of the solutions that they were going to need to live life well were going to be found in a book. And if they self-identified as a non-reader, then they would miss those solutions and they would be at the whims of like way too many other people. And so what I wanted to do was to heal the, um, I wanted to challenge the lie that number one, black kids don't like to read. And I wanted to say, if you put something in front of them that is that, that uh, mirrors their experience, they'll read it. And by doing that, I knew that I would be able to create, um, to create readers. So I'm practicing healing in that way. But the way that I'm doing that doesn't all the time get credited as healing because too often when we talk about healing, it's like, oh, you know, we need to come together. Like, like we can only heal in this place. We can only heal in this place. And I'm saying that there are so many different people who are doing the work that is there mm -hmm. in front of them. And it is having a non-negotiable, powerful healing effect. And right. as and and that is not because they're like, oh, I want to intentionally be a healer. It was like, listen, the, this hand, these hands can can do this. I can't do everything, but this one thing I can do. And so in doing mm -hmm. that, um, I, I I do that. So to the person who asks about like the role of fictional narratives, um, in educating the masses, um, my first my second book, Secret Shame, uh, found its way into a all girls, uh, boarding school on the East Coast, um. And the head nun ended up being fired because the book was about um, molestation and the girls being uh, and the girl being paid to keep quiet. And it uh, turns out that the head nun for that that particular school had been molesting the girls for five years. And they called like the the, the rape and incest number and that I had listened in the back of the um, the thing and that that had ended up, actually was reassigned to another convent. That was fiction. That was me telling a story in fiction. And that was me telling it, not even for the particular group that read it, but because my intentions were um, healing uh, and uh, responsible storytelling, uh, according to just the gifts of my insight, there was more that was happening in the universe. And so that is why I trust that I show up with, with who I need to be. And if everyone else does the same, then there is a magic um, that, that that's going to happen. It's all good. So, Anthony, if you could put Tori back on. Uh, Tori, I want to kind of, you, you know, talk to me about some of the things that you're doing uh, with the youth in the community um, to heal and to prevent future trauma. All right, is he, is it working? <laughs> so, so like yes, yeah, can, can you guys can you guys hear me now? Yes, If you, go ahead. If you can hear me, raise your fist in the air or, or thumb or something. <laughs> okay, okay, great. I felt a little left out, man. <laughs> um, I have been blessed to create a theoretical model for my programs called the Root Curriculum, DA, which is a play on my New Orleans culture. We tend to pronounce that hard D. And under the root, we have nine life themes, nine critical life areas that we study, that we shape in terms of goals, et cetera. Their spirituality, culture, career, education, economics, politics, health, the family, and then at the core of the curriculum is personal responsibility. So when the young people come in, the first thing we do is talk about spirituality, which really has very little to do with organized uh, traditional religion, but it has much to do with you taking a responsible position of saying, hey, this is what makes me feel good. This is what I believe in. This is what I understand. Of course, we have discussions where uh, we may help guide, but we don't tell people who to believe in. But what, but, but, but what we do is we try to actualize and, and have some outcomes at the end of the month, because the curriculum follows a nine month uh, school year. We have try to have some activities that the young people can grasp and easily understand. And so we start out with meditation and mindfulness and some light yoga. And we've had young people to say, I've never been 
that comfortable. I've never relaxed like that. You know, I feel like I was going to fall asleep. Um, and so this epitomizes the concept of spirituality when you can quiet yourself down and just totally relax and go deep within. And for young people, they don't get an opportunity to do that. And, and older folks don't really recognize that. We're always talking to them instead of listening to them and just being quiet with them, you know. And so I've just found that uh, this type of teaching where you listen as much as you talk or maybe even more is something that's beneficial for everyone. Plus, what we do when we come in the classroom is we learn in a round circular motion. This is an indigenous process where everybody's involved. There's no teacher standing in front of the students, giving them information and thrusting information. It's about us exchanging information and energy. And so just as changing the spiritual environment and then culturally, as the young people look around, they see images of themselves. When they step into our room, they see Harriet Tubman and Ida B. Wells, you know, and, and Dr. King, et cetera. And so it makes them feel like, hey, this is about me. You know what I'm saying? And they buy into that because it makes them feel good about themselves. So uh, that's just a little snippet of what we do. And we've been able to realize a 100 percent graduation rate. We tell them that we don't believe in excuses. There are reasons. You know, there are things that you can explain about, you know, why you didn't get, you know, the best grades you could get on this test. But excuses are not going to work because we're here to help you. You're going to help yourself. And as a community, we're going to lift everybody up. And so for the past three years, since we've had ninth graders who've gone through to the 12th grade with our program, everybody graduates, everybody, you know, and, and this is in an environment where only 25 percent of black males graduate. So we know that it works when they know that they are loved and that somebody's listening to them, that their voices are important. They help shape the curriculum. Uh, you know, we have to empower people to believe that they can solve their own issues. I can't solve their issues. I can assist them in a process, but it's going to be up to them to solve their own issues. And they have these answers inside. We just help to bring it out. So, you know, we're kind of in the vein of uh, what Tupac was talking about, a real world education. And it works. I can attest to that. And I'm blessed to be honored to do the work. Yes. So, um, Tori, I also understand that you're using your music to also help youth. Did I lose him again? <laughs> <laughs> but I heard you. Yeah, music, music is my life. You know, I, I was born in New Orleans and certainly being born in a musical city like New Orleans, you couldn't help but love music. And I grew up with music all around me. I don't know if you guys know what the second line is, but if you don't, I want to bring you down to New Orleans with me. <laughs> there you go. Lex know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know my family from and, uh, New Orleans now. Come on. So, <laughs> so, yeah. So I grew up in a very musical environment. You know, I grew up singing in the French quarters for nickels, dimes, and quarters. You know, my group, the Uptowners, I want to send a shout out to my boy, Jerome, and all of the brothers down in New Orleans. Uh, and uh, so music is central to everything that we do. When they come into the classroom, there's always a new song on. We call them freedom songs. So one day might come in and it might be Marvin Gaye, you know, mother, mother, you know what I'm saying? There's too many of you crying. Then another day they might come in and it might be the Temptations, it might be Tupac, you know, it might be Lauryn Hill, but music permeates throughout the program. And then we critically analyze the lyrics. So we listen to the songs like A Change Is Gonna Come, you know, and songs like that were really poems that were pointing people in a certain direction that was speaking to issues that were important to people's development and to their survival. You know, there are great songs that have been written that are really pieces of poetry that we break down and discuss. And so music and art and culture is very, very critical to everything I ever do in my life. Well, absolutely. And I think music has really been able to tell our stories through the years and really help to shape, you know, how we've come through this over the last 400 years. So do any of you guys want to kind of respond to that in regards to how can we use music as part of our healing process to come to go forward? I see a lot of young people online making raps and songs just in regards to the trauma that we've experienced. And, you know, it's it's beautiful and also a way to really express yourself and to release maybe some of the trauma that we're experiencing right now. 
Yeah, that's the beauty about um, music for every uh, generation. And so I love that Tori is not obligated to go out and to, you know, know like all of, and he probably, you know, because he's a musical person, he probably, you know, knows that uh, I am uh, faithful to um, Frankie Beverly. Uh, as well as a Rebirth Brass Band out of New Orleans and Trombone Shorty. I don't know, it looks like Tori froze on us again. Uh, but those are, um, you know, those are my staples uh, in terms of music and the ways that um, music is uh, so rich. But I love that, like, you know, the way Tori was just describing it, uh, he was like, okay, this is how I navigate the world. And so I am going to bring them in to the healing way in which I navigate the world. Now for me, um, I was serving as a writer on residence in a high school campus um, in South Phoenix. And um, one of the things that I, one of, one of my um, most active, <laughs> I call them active, I, you know, they, they, they were good kids. They were, they were really, really good kids. But I noticed that after lunch, they had been outside, they've been clowning, they've been all kinds of order. And then when I come in and say, okay, listen, it's time for us to, you know, to get focused, to get centered. Um, it was always hard. And so I didn't, um, they didn't enter my class to music. Uh, they entered to silence and darkness. And so for the first three or four minutes, um, I turned off the lights and I said, um, just silence, just, you know, just, just be still. And it was really amazing what happened, like just the transformation from all of that activity from lunch period to just being silent uh, for like three, four minutes. And then I turn the lights back on and then I can, you know, I can continue on um, with my lesson. There is mystery in music. There's mystery in silence. And I think that there is a responsibility for every leader, every adult who is responsible for young people, helping them, as Tori said, to not uh, teach them to think how you think, but to teach them how to think for themselves and to, uh, to guide them into that space. But you also need to practice fidelity to who you are. And for me, after lunch, I didn't want that foolishness. I, I need a silence. Uh, I'm not, uh, again, you know, it's like I'm Frankie Beverly, uh, Rebirth Brass Band and, and Trombone Shorty. The, like I'm, I'm pretty loyal you know, to the, you know, in, in those spaces. And so one of the things that um, I, I say that, you know, music can do is to help us um, however you use it and whoever you like, whoever's your jam and whoever it is that you can like, you know, can then help you help them help life to make sense to them. Um, what, whatever are the, whatever makes you a good translator, a good bridge builder, um, then, you know, then you do that. But music is most definitely that universal platform. Uh, that I think uh, is the hope chest for every community, for all of us, for, all, for the whole world, not just the black community and not just in the healing um, aspects. So uh, let's try to brainstorm some other ways. We know that, I mean, with young people to, to really all generations, music is really something that just transcends, right? There's other things like, you know, I know that in, the therapy world, or I should say the services world, they talk about restorative practices, transformative practices. You know, what does Black therapy look like, you know, when you're going into a space of healing? What does that look like? And how does it really relate culturally to people who are really walking in there to be understood? Because we know that if I am Spanish speaking and I ask for a Spanish therapist, well, hey, I'm going to get one, right? Yeah, but in, or, or if I'm even another religion, I go in and ask for that because I want them to understand me. Okay, I get that. But if we ask for a therapist, but you speak English and that's what you're going to get. So that again is talking about equity and equality. And that's not the same. I don't just don't want a therapist. I want someone who's going to understand me and also speak to therapeutic practices that are going to help me. So how do we get there? How do we really inform and educate, you know, the community to really, particularly underserved communities like Tori was talking about in regards to how he connects with the youth? That's beautiful. But how do we get more of his programs into underserved communities to help our Black youth as they have to deal with what they're seeing as we're having to explain you know, everything that's going on to our young children who are really being impacted and, and um, agitated by everything that's going on. So how do we do that? I can, can you put him back on screen, uh, Anthony, please? <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Am I back? Respond? Yeah, you're back. You're going to respond now? How do we do that? How do we get everything going on in the community? How do we help, you know, well, our that, community, our black community with healing uh, and, and not just with music? What else can we do? Well, let me just share. Let me respond to your first question. When I was at USC and in the two and a half years that I, I took classes, I was the only black male in every class I ever took. So, wow. yeah. So I, I, I saw, of course, a need for more of us to go into the profession, you know. And I think any of the brothers on here, my brother Samuel also, would probably say the farther up we go in education, the less of us we see. So somehow we have to grab young people at an early age and help them to, 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 to really realize and understand that they can go as far in education as they want to, you know. And, and we have to provide those opportunities, right, Sam? Because Sam, you know, knowing Sam's story, he comes from a very hard background, you know, just as I did. But, but, but we made it through, but most of our friends are not here. Most of the guys we grew up with are not here. So what I'm trying to do in my, in my youth work is just to, to, to get young people to understand and to accept their greatness and to understand that there's nothing I can't do. And I know people say that all the time, but it's one thing to say that, and it's another thing to be with young people through each step that you can in their lives as they realize each goal can actually actualize. We have a young man right now who comes from a home where no one in his family ever went to college. He's on his way to UCLA right now. And the reason why is because we, we stayed with him every step and made him understand that you're as good as anybody else, which is another cliche, but it's true. You're as good as anybody else. And if you really believe in yourself and you do the work and you focus and concentrate, you can make it. So in all, as you talk about you know, uh, uh, therapy, black therapy, you know, we have to have people pursue those those professions and we have to help them get there so they can be in those rooms when we walk in with these issues that we that we all have, you know. And I'm not saying that other people can't help people that are not of their ethnic background. But in order to do that, it's like a pregnant woman trying to explain to a man how it feels to go through nine months of labor. You'll never know. <laughs> You'll never really know. Uh, 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 firsthand because he can't get pregnant. But what he can do is shut up and really listen. Not just hear with his ears, but listen. You know, and really feel that pain that that, 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 that woman is telling him about as she goes through that process of having a child. You know, I've heard women talk about that and all I knew is that I wouldn't want to be a woman <laughs> and have to go through that. <laughs> right? But I have major respect for for that, and you know, I had a mother who raised me and my my three brothers, you know, and so I felt her pain and her suffering, and uh, you know, we have to be very, very, very sensitive, and we have to know when to shut up and listen, and not think that we know everything, you know, and we'll get there, but but we definitely need more black therapists out here, and uh, something needs to be done institutionally and in terms of some policy, and I think USC is trying to do that now because they've created a new program where I think you can be uh, at a 2.0 average, a 2.5 average or something like that, and still get an opportunity to attend the school and improve your grade point average as you go along. I think I'm right on that. Absolutely. Thank may, you. May, may I say something else to that, Ramona, uh, in terms yeah, of uh, how, to, how to find a couch? So um, I will say that the very first therapist that I, um, that I ever, um, I didn't realize that, uh, that I was um, dealing with a major depression. And, uh, so I went to see this one therapist and I could not relate to her at all. And even though she tried to be relevant, she uh, assigned me this reading, uh, from Ian Levan Zant and, uh, and, and it, um, for what I was feeling, it didn't necessarily land. So I felt like she was kind of doing like some sort of pot, like she, saw Iyanla on Oprah and she was like, oh, okay, Iyanla's black, Alexis black. And so maybe there's a connection there. So she was not effective at all. But the second therapist that I got um, was a an amazing older, uh, older white woman. And um, I knew I was going to love her when she, uh, when, when uh, like maybe the first or second session, uh, we were talking through something and she pointed to her head and she said, don't go up here by yourself. Take somebody with you. And that has been like some information that I have like taken with me, like from, from that point on. And I stayed with her for years, but when, um, when, when Trump was elected, 
Um, I needed to have someone that I did not, uh, that I would not have to translate any of my emotions with. And so uh, I went on, uh, went searching for an African American therapist, female therapist. And I found one by asking other African American females. So this idea that there are these unicorns and that you can't find it, well, I, I, I submit to you that they are there um, and they're ready. And they are ready for, you know, to heal. And now that, you know, in this age of, of, of COVID, uh, you know, COVID-19, um, a lot of the therapist therapy is happening online. And so like you, you, you have your, you know, the, like you have access you know, to these different folks. And so this idea, again, going back to the narrative, the narrative that somehow they are not there is not true. The fair, right. even the narrative that it has to be someone who looks like you is not necessarily true. Um, I think that um, to what Tori was saying earlier about uh, granting, you know, his students agency and letting them know the power that they have. One of the things that we have to also acknowledge is that we can have what we say. We can like it. it it's uh, it, it's possible. Um, even if we have to dig a little bit for it, if you want it bad enough then you're going to put in the work to, you know, to, to find it. Uh, so let the, uh, the hunt um, and the fact that it is such a worthwhile hunt uh, be the thing that causes you to seriously pursue um, healers, um, you know, psychologists, counselors that will help, you know, help with, with our emotional well-being and, and spiritual well-being. Thank you, Alexis. And thank you guys all, you know, for joining in the conversation tonight. So final words and call to action. What is your call to action? And how can we show up differently to address this issue? So if each of you could um, take a moment to just kind of, you know, give your final thoughts and your call to action, I would really appreciate that. So we'll start with uh, Tori, just quick call to action. And um, what can we do to address this? We have to listen to the voices of our ancestors. It was Frederick Douglass in 1856 who said, power concedes nothing without a demand. Power concedes nothing without a demand. No one who's in power is going to uh, hand over their power to you. You're going to have to demand it. You're going to have to fight and, and, and struggle and crawl or whatever you have to do. Stand up, walk, fight, whatever you have to do to demand your freedom. And so, again, looking at our traditions, as Malcolm X said, of all our studies, history is best qualified to reward our research. We're going to have to pay more attention to our history, not the history that was given to us by the conqueror or the uh, slave master. We're going to have to do as Douglas did. We're going to write our own narratives, craft our own stories. You have to be able to fight to, to know that you have to fight for yourself. And this is not to say that in, in, uh, no one else is involved, because, again, as I said earlier, We've always had great allies every step along the way. Thaddeus Stevens is somebody we need to study. Were it not for Thaddeus Stevens, there would have been no 1867 Civil Rights Bill. And so this, here, here was a white man who said to himself, we're going to have to do everything we can to change the structure of this nation. And that's what I'm advocating for now. I think we need radical reconstruction in America. All of these systems should be torn down and start over again. We need reconstruction and we need reparations. But nobody's going to give us anything. We're going to have to demand it and not take no for an answer. And I'm not talking about violence, but I'm talking about dogged determination, the kind of determination that told Harriet Tubman that even though uh, I'm free and I'm safe now, I need to go back and free somebody else. You know, taking a chance on her life time and time again to free somebody else because it, not, it was not enough for her to be satisfied with her own freedom. We have to have that kind of spirit. So I, I don't want to talk too much. I, I that probably already beautiful. did. That was beautiful, Tori. Alexis, yeah, I hope that was in action. Yeah, that was beautiful. Um, thank you for sharing, Tori. I, I, I co-sign on that. In fact, I um, I off uh, history is prophecy, um, is what I'm. Uh, you know what what I always acknowledge, and I'm. You know, I, I remind myself that we're not pioneers of this. We're not the the first to go back. And so it is important to go back and visit those old landmarks, uh, to visit the, the, the writings of our ancestors. Uh, I am deeply entrenched right now in Audre Lorde's writing, um, her essay, the, um, the master, uh, the, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, um, is a very pivotal, um, essay. 
where she talks about, um, which, which is why I'm, I'm, I'm careful um, about the kinds of things that I encourage people to focus on. If we're all the time, like focusing on, oh my God, I'm fearful. Oh my God, look at what they're doing to us. And you know, if, if that becomes sort of the thing that we harp too hard on, then that becomes a, um, it becomes a distraction from the true healing and the true revolutionary acts that are, um, that, that are present and that we can plug into if we can quiet our spirits long enough to listen in and to see exactly what, what, what are they calling us to? Um, so instead of being so overly concerned about them, um, where are you search your heart? Um, and then her other, uh, Audrey O'Lord's other, um, pivotal essay that I am, I'm actually building a meditation group around this, this particular essay. Um, it's called uh, Transforming Silence into Language and Action. And in the essay, she asked two very profound questions. She said, what do you need to say? And what are the silences that you have betrayed your, you, you betrayed, you, you, you've poured your, you betrayed your, your, your voice um, by being afraid of what you have to say when the truth is your silence does not protect you. What do you have to say? Let's be about that. So that is my call to action um, to, to, uh, to know that history is prophecy. So learn, learn history. Uh, and uh, to, uh, as Audre Lord said, um, discern what is it that you have to say? What is it that you've been quiet about and you've got to put out there, um, but you're afraid. Uh, but your silence won't protect you. If anything, it makes you complicit. So have your say. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, Ramona, we can't hear you. Oh, uh, Ramona, we lost you. I put myself on mute just so that I wouldn't make any noise when you guys were talking because I was so enthralled. But I will say that, you know, it was a beautiful conversation. I think that it's important for um, the, our community to understand the history, to understand how we are now, how to use our voices, how to use our stories, and really to be an active participant in our self-care and to understand what we need. We need to ask ourselves what we need first before we can ask others to give it to us. So uh, I'm gonna switch it over to Sam to kind of give your call to action and last words, and then we'll have Susie wrap it up. So Sam? You, you know, uh, for me, it's, it's uh, it's show up. It's one thing to feel, um, you know, one way or another over over what's happening uh, in our nation, um, what's being stirred up for for so many folks. It's another to show up. Um, Anybody else? Uh, I'm I'm my call to action is show up. Show up. You know, we have these different movements in front of in front of City Hall to show that you know we're all we're all in together on this. This is the this is the majority here in Los Angeles. Um, show up. Show up. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate that, Susie. So. I wanna thank everyone so much for your bravery and sharing your powerful voices and heartbeats. And we encourage everyone to check out episode one, which is Alexis, um, that dropped last Sunday. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Alexis. When we don't share our stories, other people tell them and they don't get it right. We have a responsibility and an obligation to tell our stories. You know, and uh, and then also I just, I want to thank uh, Anthony uh, for his technical assistance uh, in making all this happen. Uh, thank you to CalArts African uh, Music and Dance Ensemble um, for the drumming uh, from the Northern Ghana. Um, and then also uh, stay tuned for our episode two uh, on June 14th where uh, in Kevin Demfo, uh, founder of Lumis Transforms, talks about healing through embodiment and how we can uh, relieve our suffering. Oh, you're muted, Ramona. Uh-oh. Again, I said, OK, I said, thank you guys so much for joining us. We're going to end bringing back the, the drumming. As we know, that is a very uh, significant healing practice from uh, 
Ghana, as Anthony said. So we'll, we'll end with that. And thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you all.